Hi, everyone. Welcome to the first Thread Talk of the day. Uh, we're excited that you are joining us. Um, before we um, start into today's, this hour's programming, I want to give you a look ahead of what's left on our schedule today. Um, following this, we have another exciting Thread Talk presentation featuring three more speakers. Um, we also have another Marketplace Live at 3 p.m. Eastern featuring the Fiber Studio. And don't miss out on our 4 p.m. studio tour with Patsy Zavatoski. And please make sure you register in advance for that one so we can get you in. Um, and then we close the night at 5.30 p.m. Eastern with a Marketplace Live featuring Lunatic Fringe Yarn. But right now, the session you're here for right now is Thread Talks. It's our playoff of TED Talks. Um, it'll feature three speakers, and they will be speaking on various topics for about 15 minutes each. And because we want this session to be very informative, this is there will be no question or answers, um, but we'll be sure to provide contact information in the chat if you want to follow up with the speakers afterward for more information. First up, we have Liz Hine, and she is here today to tell us how to pivot to a virtual guild sale. Take it away, Liz. Thank you. Thank you, HGA, for the opportunity to share uh, our experience. I'm going to share my screen and go over some slides. Okay. And so I'm going to talk about how to pivot uh, to a virtual guild sale. And it's what got us here, the pivot that we had to do this year, where we are now in our websites. I've been sale chair for Westfield Weavers Guild for the last seven sales. It's a small guild of about 16 to 18 people, and our sale is only one day with a few artists, but almost the whole guild participates in a guild event. This is my third year as the sale chair for Jockey Hollow Weavers, along with Jerry Shankler uh, on the sale committee. And the Jockey Hollow sale has had some lean years with dwindling participation, uh, but still a loyal following of customers. And it's been hard to get the guild energized and engaged. In 2017, we streamlined the checkout process, which kept the line moving and greatly reduced errors, which pleased the artists. In 2018, I streamlined the treasurer's role where receipts and artist inventory were processed at the same time. And this allowed the treasurer to complete the books at the end of a two-day sale while we were still packing up. I've been on the guild agenda every meeting with presentations on tags, analysis of the last sales, uh, discussions of what to make, strategies and pricing. I've also written something up in every newsletter. And this increased the focus of the sale throughout the year and has resulted in increased participation by artists and many more volunteering for the sale day. And this resulted, 2019 was our best sale yet in its 26 year history. So you're very happy about that. And we started 2020 with the hopes of uh, not getting quite to those numbers, but at least getting close and keeping up the interest and the participation in the sale. The sale location contract was signed and paid for. Our postcards were designed. This was our postcard for the next year. We're getting ready to print in March so that people could hand them out uh, from the May meeting onwards. Uh, then New Jersey closed down and we put printing on hold. Next, I'm going to talk about the pivot. So we kept an eye on things through May, and it didn't look to me like we could count on everything clearing by November for an in-person sale. Other guilds were starting to talk about it, even if our location would potentially allow it. I wasn't keen on a sale with limited access, one-way traffic, and the issues of disinfecting. And so in May, I wrote up a four-page plan for a curbside pickup sale with centralized e-commerce guild website that I would coordinate, a single location for artist drop-off of sold items and the consolidation of those into buyer's bags and then a curbside pickup at our regular location, which conveniently had a circle drive that we could make one way. 
I talked to Jerry about this and we agreed the logistics could work. It would be a large effort on my part without opportunity for much help because we couldn't really get together. And it would count on the artists complying with certain tasks like photographing, getting their stuff organized um, to the drop off point. The question remained, though we could, should we do it this way? And to think about it, I came up with a better plan, one that keeps in touch with our customers while not landing the burden on just a few people. And it was important to keep in touch with our customers. We know from anecdotal information that some of them have been coming for 20 or 25 years. So early in July, I presented uh, to the Jockey Hollow Board that we run this sale with the main purpose as a perk for our members. Postcards are by far our best advertising you have connection with the customer and the best connection with the customer. So these had to be part of the plan. We would modify the postcard to point the customers to a Jockey Hollow website, which would have links to artists, Etsy sites, Facebook pages, e-commerce sites. The participating artists would share the cost of the printing and sending of the postcards. And I'd handle this rather than going through the treasurer. Artists would be responsible for setting up and maintaining their own sites, processing sales, collecting any sales tax, doing their own shipping or curbside pickup. Nothing would flow through the Guild account, so there would be no bank charges to Jockey Hollow. The Guild would not take a portion of the sales, nor would they collect sales tax. I would set up the sale web page with links to the artist's sites, and we'd adjust this for descriptions, pictures, etc depending on the number of artists and how best to lay it out. At this point, we didn't know who we would have in. The board approved and the Jockey Hollow referral sale was on its way. Next, I'll talk about where we are now. To give artists time to get their sites in order, I sent a note to Guild members on July 22nd, telling them of our plan and setting up a call for July 29th, which was to discuss the whole plan, answer any questions, and to go over what they might be curious about. The commitment date was set further out to September 15th after our first guild meeting so that artists had time to make sure they want to go forward, that they had time to set up their sites and know that they, they wanted to do this. About five artists were committed by the time of our first call, and we had another call on August 10th with Etsy tips and on 31st for any questions and more tips. By the cutoff, we had 14 participating artists. We reviewed the sites that were up. We had another call on October 1st for a final look at everything. The herding of cats continued and all info was in by Sunday. I worked with our webmaster on Sunday and the page went live on the Jockey Hollow website on October 4th in the afternoon. We held a preview call on October 5th for our members. A handful of members showed up and quite a few of the artists and it was a nice show and tell, expanded show and tell of, uh, of our items. We flipped through the Jockey Hollow page following the links to the artist sites and chatted about the contents. And the postcards also went out that week, or this week, it's this week. So now I'm going to uh, take you over to our, to our website. So I'm going to stop sharing and then reshare when I get on the website. In just a moment, I will do that. I think I'll take you through my screen. Okay. Sorry, I didn't get you on the right screen. Okay, now I'll try to share again. Okay, so this is the Jockey Hollow website. And if you come into the main jockeyhollowweavers.org, you can easily get to the sale page by clicking on the uh, annual show and sale. And at the top of the page, we used artist pictures and these are hot linked to the particular websites. These are, to keep things kind of in order, the websites are listed in order of people's first name. And then we decided to do the pictures roughly in reverse. So though Tina's at the bottom of our list, she's first up here in the picture click. And most of the artists are using Etsy. 
we'll, we'll start with barrels and show you that. And uh, we went over Etsy and during our calls, and we certainly talked about if you haven't used it in a while, they have made huge improvements on it. It's much easier than it was even like less than a year ago. Uh, we did discuss flowing on your inventory, which uh, then hits the Etsy algorithm. And Etsy, Etsy actually has tips and hints on this. And two of our members did get picked up on the uh, uh, crawl for Etsy and got sales while they were flowing on their items. And this is Brianna's site with her dragon shawls and cowls. And uh, Caroline has had a site up for quite a while and then has updated it with newer things. I think she was one of our uh, main with experience of Etsy. Daryl has her site up with her patterns and um, I think her patterns are off the other, yeah, the digital monographs. And then she has some of her smaller items here and she's busy sewing tote bags, I understand, to put more up and has a scarf. Oh yeah, she's got a tote up. And there's some scarves. And Ducky is setting up her site. Um, she has her e-commerce site and will be selling felted goods. Needle felted kits, fiber creations, cute little sheep. Hetty has a hybrid. She has her own website, and then she uses the Etsy shop for her towels uh, so that they're collecting her tax and dealing with that. Jerry's site, she's still working on it. Joanna is local to the area where our postcards are, so um, is just doing the email. Karen had had an Etsy site years ago and has re-upped it and has a large selection of goods. And this is my site, We Like Yarn. And if you need to contact me, you can come into the Contact Us page. And this will also allow you, you can either put a message or you can tick any of the boxes to get on our mailing list also. Lois has had an Etsy site for many, many years. And uh, we're hoping she gets even more traction. She's been one of our steady sellers on Etsy. We're hoping she gets even more traction through our postcard sales. Sherry, again, had an Etsy site that she's re-upped and has been having fun with her uh, descriptions. This one I particularly liked. If you can see it on the side, which came first. I think my picture is, is overriding it. And then lastly, we have Tina's site. And Tina, thanks to Tina for our postcards, she does our postcard design. And she's put up her hand-woven towels and placemats and lovely scarves. And as I said, she's the first now in the pictures. So you can get to anybody's site through these pictures. And then lastly, if anybody wants to be added, this will take them to the We Like Yarn uh, site where I can monitor the picture, or sorry, the postcards and the mailing list. So one, one thing to mention that um, Etsy has all this had a pop to the top, you know, free shipping and things like that, because we're driving uh, traffic directly to our site via our postcards and our loyal customers. We don't really need to worry about some of the Etsy algorithms and how do you get to the top and what words to use. So that kind of took out some of the complication of it. And we've sent about 750 postcards. Uh, and we have already had, as I said, a few sales that while well, people are flowing on. And I have to, I'm happy to report that I had my first sale last night with one of our postcard recipients. So the postcards got out and the person went in right away and bought something. Uh, this sale page is going to stay live for the year. So the artist can contribution to the payment of that also gets them a year of links and advertising. And I have to say, we're all hoping for successful clearing of our old inventory and our new inventory. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Liz. Um, that was a great presentation on how we can adapt to current times and continue on um, and still try to benefit our members. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Michaela Sador, who is going to show us or tell us 
how to look at and understand tapestries. Hi. Take it away, Michaela. Glad to see you all. And I'm just going to try to give you the most information that I can. And I will begin now. I have written a book called The Art is the Cloth. It has long been a concern of mine how, as a tapestry weaver, I can talk about tapestries. And in the last 30 years, I have had a lot of experience with giving talks to groups. And then about six years ago, I organized an exhibition. And then this year, I've published a book. And it has to do with all the different ways that the art is the cloth, that is, the tapestries highlight their identity as a piece of cloth. And so I'm going to walk you through some of the things that I did in the book so that you will have some idea of what it is that I think matters when you're looking at tapestries and what I think will help you when you're looking at tapestries. So just let me share the screen and bring up. There we go. Oops. Ain't technology grand. Okay. Um, I have divided the talk into groups of pieces that reflect back on the chapters that I have in the book itself. And the first is the elements of weaving. That is, as we all know, at least warp and weft, as well as color, as well as design. And so the piece that I wanted to show you here is this piece by Pat Taylor from England called Mute. It is a piece made on a traditional loom, that is to say a frame, and you can see the warp very, very clearly, and you can see the weft very, very clearly. And you can see that she's woven on both the front shed and the back shed to make these figures. And the way that she gives you all this visual information about threads is a celebration of what it is that she's doing to remind you that this is a piece of cloth. The next is special materials, that is not just wool, cotton, linen, things like that, silk, but also other things like feathers, gold, fleece, um, other animal hair that you might not expect. This, for instance, is a piece by an, a Hungarian tapestry weaver, Zsuzsa Pirelli. And the significant ingredient in this that makes it a special material is her use of the feathers. So that you have something that almost looks like some kind of framed image of Asta Nielsen, who is a real person, as surrounded by these absolutely beautiful things that echo the look of those feathers in the garment that she's wearing. And then this piece, Merlux, which was designed by Nicholas Schiffer and put together at the Manufacture Nationale des Gobelins, that is the French National Tapestry Studios. It was part of their experimental uh, studio that they set up in the 1970s. And so to make it, they used hospital tubes and a metal frame. I've seen it on display and it looks like a stained glass window with the light shining through it. What is interesting is that when they made it, of course, the, the clearest tubes had a, a kind of white look and over time, those have yellowed. So it's an interesting question about materials, how they work and how they don't work. Then there are the visual themes, the things that we got used to when we look at tapestries. There are frames, there are certain kinds of images. And for this, I've chosen to look at the verdures, the greenery that show up in lots and lots of tapestries, sometimes as mille fleur, and sometimes in this case. I'm sorry that the left border is not in this. It had to do with scanning, uh, image, capturing an image from a book, and the book could not get flat enough for me to be able to get that left-hand side. But as you see, it is intensely filled with the leaves and the trees and the dragon biting into the panther's neck. And I said, but that's a leopard and found out that leopards and panthers are essentially the same thing. That a creature is a black panther is a specific piece of information about that kind of leopard. But then you have a piece like this, which is from the 20th century, Dom Robert, L'Herbe Haute, the high grass, where you once again have a very rich field full of all the images with that turkey and that rooster and all of the grasses and all of the flowers. Uh, Dom Robert was known for caring about 
putting together images that reflected on the nature around him. And then you have this piece by Marus Abdu, Cactus and Flamboyant Tree. He is among the weavers in Egypt at the Harania Studio set up in the 1950s by Wasa Wisif, uh, Ramses Wasa Wisif. And so if you look carefully, you will see towards the middle that there are lots and lots of birds, but you will also see these amazing trees and just everything, everything, just all jammed together. But again, each of these shows a different sensibility. Ben Trumploy, which is, you think that this has dimension, it does not. David Cochran works at the Dovecot Studio in Scotland, but this is a piece that he made himself. And making things like this work, where you see dimensionality, where actually it's just flat, is something that a skillful weaver can do by the strategy that they undertake in the weaving. Where are the lights? Where are the darks? Where are the transitions? And he's done this especially well. Then directionality is an idea that I had, which is to say that the direction that you follow on the warp says something about the thing that you will make. And this is a piece that very much did that. Tom Phillips is an imaginative, whimsical artist who is English, and he worked with the Dovecot a number of times and wanted to do a piece which would reflect on the colors that they used between a particular period of time. So you have four months worth of what the colors were and every day they would flip coins to see how much of that color would be included in the tapestry. But it is a tapestry that began on the left side, the left would have been the bottom of the tapestry and then follows through on what was happening. So it's a way of recording the nature of the studio. A number of people take advantage of the orientation of their weaving to do something that will reflect on that in what they've woven. And then textiles and identities. We think of that in the United States as Navajo weaving, for instance. But in Peru, Maximo Laura is a national treasure. This is his moon festival tapestry. He's known for his brilliant colors. And I have gotten out one particular detail, which just may make it a slightly bit easier to see some of what we're looking at. And that is a prone figure who seems to have feathers in his hair. The colors are as brilliant as ever. There are, if you look back at the tapestry, large numbers of eyes that show up here, there, and everywhere. But indeed, looking at it in sections enables you to see a little bit more clearly what, what is going on in the piece. What is interesting about these pieces is that textiles are so important to the particular groups that make them that they do become part and parcel of their identities. Self-reference is an art historical term, I believe, and it has to do with making the thing that you're making of the thing that you're making. That is, this is about clothing and you're weaving cloth an image of clothing within a weaving. Barbara Heller did a series of pieces called cover-ups. This is one of them. And what was important to her is that you do not see the face, you do not see the eyes, you cannot know what's going on. There's something creepy about not being able to see those things. That figure in the middle looks ghostly and worrisome. Then the last section is historical self-reference. There are hero tapestries at the cloisters in New York is a good place to see them. And there are heroine tapestries. And here's one, Penthesilea, the queen of the Amazons who is at the Angers Chateau in France. So who are our heroines? Well, it turns out there are a lot of pieces devoted to Joan of Arc. One woven at the beginning of the 20th century at the French National Studios. And I took this picture myself at the San Francisco Opera House. And then these images, which are Susan Martin Maffei's very stylized clothing and uh, beautiful um, simplicity of piousness. And Cecilia Blomberg's Joan of Arc, which is on the right and is about being a warrior where you see the entire figure and where the verticality of the piece matters a lot. So these are ways that contemporary weavers are thinking about the idea of heroines. Now, the last thing I will show you is my book. I will tell you that the cover of the book is uh, an image of a tapestry called Hand to Hand, woven by Cecilia Blomberg, published by Schiffer Books at the end of July. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. It's the art is the cloth, one word, at gmail.com. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Michaela. What a wonderful presentation. 
And I know for myself, I've always been so fascinated by tapestry um, and how it's made because they're so wonderful. Well, I'm glad you liked the presentation. I know that I ran through it pretty quickly, but it'll show you some of what I was doing. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Next up, we have our own Sally Orgren, the editor of our magazine, Shuttle Spindle and Dye Pot. And she is gonna be presenting on the topic from concept to claw. Take it away, Sally. Hello, thank you, Whitney. Um, welcome. When um, a couple, recently, uh, I've been weaving a couple of years now, uh, I was asked what I like to weave. And my response was kind of surprising to myself. I realized I don't typically like to weave things um, like a scarf or a towel. And I don't like to necessarily weave particular fiber like tensile or cotton. But what I do like to weave is a challenge. So my favorite things are give me a challenge and then let me figure out how to weave it and what the cloth will become. So I'm hoping that this talk, I'm going to give you three examples of challenges, will give you some inspiration and some ideas on how to flesh out some of these ideas to maybe make some original cloth and to make some um, something that we all haven't seen before. So the first challenge that I'm going to start with was based on architecture. And these challenges, I'm going to go old school here because I didn't have a time to pull all my digital assets and put a PowerPoint together. Um, so the first challenge was based on architecture. And this is um, a series of challenges that I'm going to talk about from a group called Cross Country Weavers. It's 30 weavers, many names who you might recognize, that um, do a yearly sample exchange. And it's due in March. And the collection, um, the sample book collection from all 60 years, there um, is a collection that resides at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and a second set of archived sample books at the Thousand Island Art Center. So if these sample books sound interesting, they are accessible. So I want to mention that right up front. So I went to Chaco Canyon and what really struck me um, when I thought about this architectural challenge was in the ruin sites, the uh, size, the different size of the elements that were used to construct these um, the walls of these buildings. And as weavers, I find that what we tend to do is we tend to pick like a 5-2, 3-2 cotton and then for our warp and then we cross it with the same thing and we get a, a very nice fabric. But what happens if we use different size elements in our warp? That was kind of where the thought started in terms of the inspiration. So Broussard has I think eight different sizes of unmercerized uh, cotton and I ordered one tube of each size. And when I got the tubes and I started playing with it, I realized that, hey, if I put two threads together, I can amplify the size of some of these yarns. So now I have maybe more than eight sizes of yarn. Now, when you can, you can do this two ways. You can put them in two heddles next to each other, which is what I did or on the same shaft, or you can put the two threads in a single heddle. And when that happens, the effect is a little different because the yarns tend to twist around each other a little bit. So I opted for the two that traveled together. The second consideration that I needed to think about was my reed. So again, as beginner weavers, when we, when we uh, start weaving, we usually have a 12 shaft or 12 dent reed, and we uh, put one thread per dent. And Pretty quickly, we suddenly realized that um, we could, with that 12 dent read, we could get a variety of sets. So we could slay it 221 or 1212. So I thought, okay, I need to think about this a little differently. I need to think about how to slay the thick threads, which might be one ends per inch or EPI. And I need to think about how to slay the section with the thinner threads, which um, would be tighter. So I needed to pick a read that was more open like um, six, eight, or 10 dent. I think I ended up on a 10 dent read. Um, so I think those were the considerations and I put together my draft. And this is an example of what the draft looked like. And you can see right here, this row where these are, which is under the threading, those different dots and the X's kind of represent the combination of the fiber size and the um, way that I was gonna slay it. Now, when I put the warps on and I started weaving, there were a couple more revelations that happened. One was that I love the texture, the variety of texture was really cool. Um, but the second thing that, that I noticed is that I really didn't need to use that many threads. I could really simplify the number of threads that I was using. And if you think about it, if you use that many different threads in the warp and you want to make a balanced weave, I was using that many different 
bobbins and shuttles. So it was a little bit difficult to treadle. And I was kind of thinking about, I had to do 32 samples, a generous size. So I'm thinking a little bit about efficiency at this point. So the other thing that occurred to me, I'll start with the bottom. I'm gonna hold them a little bit further back and then I'll bring them close. I thought, let's try an alternate weft and make the, the place where the cells are recessed bigger. And then I thought, well, let me try it with the warp. So I'm gonna try and hold it very still here. And what I do when I try and experiment and I wanna change the warp out is I just lift the treadles, take a Sharpie and color the warp threads because I just need a quick answer. Um, so I, it's funny when I pulled out the sample, I was like, oh, D, did I rethread? But no, that's just Sharpies and um, burgundy Sharpies and a darker brown left. Um, so, and, and from a distance, you can kind of start to see the difference in the, in the sizes, okay? So when I went to do the final sample for the group, I ended up choosing kind of a dust colored weft. That's a 16, let me show you the front first. That's a 16 uh, two um, weft in there, the little fine weft, and then a couple of different sizes of the unmoisturized natural cotton. And this, again, I wanna show you the backside because remember not every pattern, the front is the same as the back. So I definitely preferred the front. My guild happened to have a design challenge at the same time, the same year, a little later. So most of my guildmates have eight shaft looms or less. That pattern was a 10 shaft pattern. So I simplified the pattern and I wove two variations of it on a 10 shaft loom. And I just wanted to show you, this is the fabric sample that resulted. You can see I did a little bit of work on the sides there and between these samples, but I got those differential size units um, from an eight shaft. So that, the, I usually put on quite, quite a few yards because I have to do so many samples. And that project, actually, I had enough to make a blanket when I was all said and done. I put it in the guild sale and it sold. And um, so I thought success, um, but <laughs> the customer came back a year later and was looking for more and that was a one of a kind. And I wasn't gonna be doing it soon. <laughs> I had moved on. The second challenge I want to share with you is was based on a book. So this was the book and it was suggested by Barbara Walker, who's part of our group. And in this book, the authors visited most of the major continents, picked a few targeted locations and studied the color um, that was used in houses and that was um, th that was adapted by the different cultures or communities in those locations. Since I live in the greater metro New York area, yeah. and Greenwich Village was one of the um, places that they visited, I thought it would be kind of interesting to, to go to that neighborhood and see what it looked like today. So these are pictures from the book on a particular street in Greenwich Village. And it was one of those neighborhoods where they have kind of color codes uh, for the buildings. So one of these pictures is from the mid 80s and the other one is from the mid 90s. So this is what the same block from the same angle looks like in 2018. Now, when I got there and I looked at these buildings, first of all, when I took this picture, I was stopped by a pedestrian on the street asking me what I was doing. And what I found out is Anna Wintour lives in one of these brownstones. So apparently paparazzi hang out quite a bit. And she, so she was, the resident was pretty interested in the project I was working on. But um, the bottom line is these colors, I would never include in my palette or think to put together. So I thought this is an excellent color challenge for myself is to figure out how to work with these colors in an acceptable manner. And what I found was the most um, difficult for me were, were kind of these super dark colors and heavy colors with such light, you know, baby blue and kind of beigey and kind of a light yellow down here. Um, so I wanted to show you a little bit of, again, a non-computer kind of design process, old school if, if you don't necessarily have software. But what I did is I took some of the photos I took and I entered them into one of those programs, which the one I used was called Tin Eye, but Will Sherman Williams has them, different paint companies have them. And they take your photograph and break it down into color blocks and kind of help you identify the ratio of colors that are being used. Um, so when I did that, what I found out was that the angle of the picture that I took, which is right here, helped minimize some of those blocks of color. So instead of being seen equally as if you were standing right across the street, Shooting at an angle meant that if I were going to do a stripe pattern, which I was playing with with color pencils over here, I, I decided I wasn't going to make the stripes equidistant. Um, they were going to be um, irregular in um, width. And I also tend to do a yarn wrap here because not only am I trying to determine set, but I'm also trying to determine 
the stripe colors, um, how wide they're going to be, what I'm going to do. The, the other thing that kind of occurred to me when I was playing with the colored pencils and looking at the pictures is that the windows probably broke up those blocks of color that I found so, um, in some cases, offensive, a little bit offensive. And so I thought, let me try and add some accent stripes that will break up those um, blocks of color. Now, I'm going to show you, this is the draft. And I could have done this on four shafts. I could have had um, two shafts, could have done the ground cloth, and then I would have needed um, two additional shafts to do those accent stripes. Um, and this is a point that um, Marcy wrote about this um, in, the, in the most, the issue that SSD that, that you guys probably have in your homes right now about why you might want to expand a draft beyond the minimum number that you need. And I do it often. And the reason I do it is because I was weaving with 16 to cotton and I did not want to have to move heddles on my loom. I keep a couple hundred heddles on the first couple shafts, but it wasn't enough for this project at this width. So I just extended them out um, to save myself time on that. And Marcy in her article talks about several reasons why you might want to do that. On this project, I didn't do a bunch of sampling. I just put the full yardage on and went ahead and wove it off. <clears throat> and um, so once I get a sample, and, and in the sampling, what I was doing is I was trying, I have to make sure I have this the right way. <clears throat> I was trying, let me hold this up against a this paper so you're not, um, it's not, okay, so I'm trying different wefts. When I have a really brightly colored stripe pattern, the two yarns that I typically never choose for weft would be black and white because a lot of times I feel like they kill the stripe pattern. In this case, I surprised myself by using white, but it was a much thinner white. It was like a, a 20 slash two. So it was really minimized, but you can see trying out different widths, different colors um, in the stripe pattern. <clears throat> and as I was saying, put the full width on to sample, cut the sample in half, wash half of it, and then I do not wash half of the other half. So I kind of have a, uh, an idea of the wet finishing, the hand, the, the um, shrinkage take up. So you can see which one obviously was not washed and which one was washed in terms of the drapeability. Um, so once I completed the sample responsibility, I had enough warp left and I wove off a, a whole bunch of series of towels. Now again, I put the towels in the guild sale and I think they sold within two hours. So I walked in it. 11 o'clock and, and there were no towels left. So again, success. Now I want to share with you the failure because failures are actually sometimes more fun than the successes, um, <clears throat> believe it or not. So this year for the challenge, it was a grouped topic. It was birds, butterflies, and bugs. And we get our challenge topics a couple years in advance. So you have time to think about it. And of course, silly me, I um, saw this picture in National Geographic. I had no idea there was such a thing as a glass wing butterfly. And I thought, well, wouldn't this be cool to think about how to, how to weave transparency? And um, I, I have been a follower of Deanna Deeds and she had a piece in Small Expressions, I think two years ago that was made with monofilament, layers of mono, woven monofilament. And um, Anastasia Azur, I took her class at uh, Convergence Rhode Island and heard her lecture. So the idea of weaving with a non-conventional material like monofilament was kind of in my mind. I thought, oh, that'd be a new challenge. Now, in talking about this idea with um, another friend, he had taken this picture of a chrysalis. And I thought, well, this is the idea of transparency again, and it fits with the 3B theme. And so I thought this is kind of was, you know, kind of my mood board. Um, I did a bunch of sketches. And um, this is an example of some of the sketches that I did. And then I did a needle weaving. I don't know if you've tried a needle weaving or not, but this was my needle weaving. So there were a couple of pieces of information I was looking for. Um, first of all, I was looking for what would be an appropriate set for the monofilament, which is this basically like fishing line. You can get a bunch of different sizes. So I was also testing different materials, uh, how thick. Um, sewing, invisible sewing thread was too thin. Um, I wanted to test wool because I was thinking I would put a wool, um, maybe a, um, a orange and black wool border um, on, on it to represent the wings of the butterfly that were orange and black. Um, so I was testing a little bit of wool. Of course, I hope you can see the iridescent uh, thread. It was way too slippery. It wasn't going to work. So it, good idea, but I needed to think a little bit more about that. 
And then for the butterfly wing, that's just, I go to the store and get paint chips. That's just a paint chip in the right color with a little bit of Sharpie and some white out to quickly articulate this idea. Um, I was thinking about doing a double weave. And so when you do a double weave, um, you need to have two shafts for your top layer, two shafts for your bottom layer. And I, I should be more specific. It was a, like a pocket. So it was double, double cloth, double layered, joined at the sides. And when I joined it at the sides, I needed to add two more shafts because I wanted to do plain weave on those sides. So it's gonna be a pocket. And I was thinking I would print a, a picture of greenery that I shot and stick that picture, print it on a transparent material and stick it in this pocket and then cut out the shape of the, um, of the um, butterfly, the glass wing butterfly. So proof of concept, yes. Um, one of the tips I learned from Anastasia was to use hot glue uh, to do your knots because fishing line is pretty squirrely. Um, but the, I had to do this on a Structo 248, which is the little metal eight inch wide loom. It's so small in the front that when I wove this, and this is just mylar, it's kind of a transparent, opaque mylar. Um, when I put it on the loom, it was too, too small and it started to cause distortion in the, in the web. And I think if I hold it up close here, you can start to see that where the warps started to drift apart. And I wasn't happy about that. But the deal killer was when the spousal unit walks by, takes a look at what's on your loom and says, you're not gonna submit that, are you? So I was like, guess not. Um, so I went to idea two, the chrysalis idea. And I also made an adjustment in set because I thought maybe the, the migration, um, I'm gonna show this without the black first. I thought maybe the migration of the um, warp threads because of the open set was the problem. So I tightened the set so the piece got smaller. I needle felted the, um, the, the butterfly wing. Keeping in mind, if I did this for the sample exchange, I was gonna have to do 32 of these, but that was okay. Um, I took this off the loom and again, um, there was this distortion even worse kind of than before. Um, but the even bigger deal killer on this one was I, turn, I took one look at it and I thought, this looks like a dead butterfly caught in a net. <laughs> I'm not gonna do this. It's, you know, and at this point I realized I had to really abandon the whole, the whole idea. This, this was not gonna work for the three Bs theme. And this is the point where I said, people say, pay attention to your materials. You sometimes hear students say that, or you see, you hear exhibiting artists say that and like, what does it mean? So I looked at what was on the loom and I thought, well, the, the, the idea of this was the transparency. And so let's not think about trying to do bugs, butterflies, and bees or whatever but what what are some transparent kind of things and so i thought well you know you hang stuff in the window that's transparent you might put something on your christmas tree that's transparent so i borrowed some yarn from a neighbor thought about a little simple snowflake cut it out you know out of that same um i don't know if you can hear the crunchy paper in there but the mylar the mylar material um and again i had i had the distortion uh, to some extent. Um, and I was like, you know, that's okay. <laughs> but that idea led to another idea. So I made a quick sketch while in this, I was doing, I was working on this in January of this year. I made a quick sketch and I thought, Ooh, this might be a cool idea for a film strip. And I could print, make black and white photographs, maybe from my childhood or my family and do some kind of maybe more of a personal piece. And so I've actually embarked on the process. I'll be setting up a loom hopefully this weekend. And again, I've, I've made some, I'm going to do a different structure and I've made some um, uh, transparencies that allude to this, um, this idea of a film strip. And so that's where um, I'm headed next with this idea that initially didn't work out so well. Um, so I hope I've encouraged you to, to try some weeding challenges and to maybe produce some cloth that we haven't seen before. And I, I hope that you'll share those with me um, because I, I in turn like to share them with as many other people as, as I can. So thank you. Thank you, Sally. You are never shy with new ideas. <laughs> They're always streaming from you and we love hearing all about them. And if you weren't able to join us earlier this week with Sally, who is the editor of our Shuttle Spindle and Dive Pot magazine, I know she is always looking for new stories to share and feature in the magazine. So be sure to reach out with to her if you have any ideas that you want to see in the magazine. 
And Sally will be showing off some of her work in the informal fashion show tomorrow. So be sure to join us in that on Sunday. And next up, we have another round of Thread Talks at 2 p.m. Eastern. So hop over there and we'll see you in a few minutes.